Hello and welcome to Unpublished TV. I'm Ed Hand. UTV is the newest production from Unpublished Media. This weekly live panel discussion completes our set of four internet properties created to help you influence and impact public policy, public policy decision making here in Canada. Those are unpublishedottawa.com, the Unpublished Cafe podcast, which I also host, and unpublished.vote, an issue-based information and voting platform. Each week, we introduce a new topic through the Unpublished Cafe podcast and Unpublished Vote, where you'll find the podcast and background information from a variety of sources to help further you inform you before you cast your vote and email your MP to tell them why you think the way you do. Every Monday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, we'll reconvene here on UTV to examine how the issue has evolved and how you, the audience, reacted to the poll question. Today, this is our inaugural episode, and thank you for joining us. We'll be looking back over the last four months since the coronavirus came ashore in Canada. I'd like to welcome Warren Kinsella, lawyer and political commentator. Peggy Mason is the president of the Rideau Institute, and Rewat Dianandan is a professor of epidemiology at the University of Ottawa. Viewers are encouraged to send questions and comments for us as well, and we'll discuss those with the panel, and you can do that on Facebook Live or on YouTube. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic has turned our world upside down. Lockdowns, restrictions, billions of dollars in spending at all, by all levels of government to keep the economy in motion, although we are in a recession, according to the C.D. Howe Institute. Let's face it, we're, we're staring at a pretty deep financial hole right here. And we're going to have to climb out. Our unpublished.vote question on the economic impact found 62% feel the recession will last longer than 18 months. We'll start with you, Warren. Do you see that lasting longer than 18 months? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, I mean, it's apparent that, you know, we're some distance from a vaccine. I defer to uh, the expertise of people who are more expert than I, but uh, I pay attention to public affairs, and it seems evident that that is some time away. Uh, and even if we have one, you know, our ability to vaccinate the planet, uh, several billion people, is going to be elusive as well. So I think economically and politically, what we've got is what we are going to have. And I have to say, in the main, uh, most of our governments in Canada uh, and this is in striking contrast to the UK and Brazil and the United States, um, have done pretty well. Incumbency, you know, prior to the pandemic had been a curse. Um, there were many uh, governments who were being defeated after their first term. That doesn't seem to be the case anymore. I think the people have come to appreciate in the pandemic that there's a role, proper role for government, and they've evaluated those who are running government. And in, as I say, for the most part, uh, our federal and provincial governments are seen as having done quite well in Canada. And uh, I would say we're pretty lucky as a consequence. Well, we just have to look below the 49th parallel to, to you know, get a grip on that. Peggy, what, what do you think? 18 months or longer for this recession? Or or maybe we'll get back on track early. Yeah, I, I that it's not my area of expertise. So I think I, but I think I would echo. I think I would echo what Warren Kinsella has said. Just because um, I mean we're you know we're in it for the long haul. We're doing well, but we know you know we've got the fall and the flu season staring mm -hmm. us in the face to get through. And so, um, you know, we've got to prepare. There are going to be um, hot spots and they're going to be, you know, we get going and then we have to pull back in some areas. And all the time we've got um, the drag. I mean, if our economy is so intertwined with United States and United States is, you know, their, their failure. Well, Trump did not only not deal with COVID, I mean, he fanned the flames, if you will, of COVID. And so, you know, they're, they're just, uh, you know, the numbers are just going up exponentially. And so that, of course, is going to greatly impair their ability economically to recover. And that's, you know, unfortunately, mm -hmm. intertwined as we are, is going to impact, uh, is going to impact us as well. So, um, so yes, I think we're, you know, it's, it's, you know, thank God the one, you know, the great, the saving grace though, is that, you know, interest rates are, you know, are almost non-existent. 
And so, you know, if people get worried about the big amounts of money being borrowed, but this is the time to borrow it. And what we have to hope is when we get through this, but it will take time, then, you know, economic recovery will, uh, you know, will, you know, will eat up, will eat up that, uh, that, that uh, debt because there aren't these big interest payments to pay. So I'd be a little more optimistic. In other words, like if there ever was a time when you have to spend all that money, um, you know, this is the time to do it. We even had a stage where there were minus interest rates. So, you know, this is, this is the time to do it. Ray, I, as an epidemiologist, uh, I, I wonder, you know, if we are starting to see things come back financially, economically, uh, how bad is the second wave going to stifle that? Well, oh, that's, I was prepared to answer the first question. I, <laughs> okay, we'll get to that question. too, don't worry. <laughs> um, the second wave is likely in that we still have a largely susceptible population. We have about maybe 5% of the population has been exposed to the virus, we think. That means 95% are still susceptible. So as long as we have the virus present in society, then there's a likelihood of reemergence. Now, it's possible that it just goes away. It's unlikely, but it's possible because SARS kind of just went away. What's more likely, I think, is that if we are strategic in how we deploy our public health infrastructure, like the mask wearing and the testing and the isolation and the diligence around surveillance, it's possible to keep that reemergence to a simmering boil in the background or maybe a handful of cases here and there that do not have to progress into outbreaks. So uh, is a second wave inevitable? Mathematically, it is, but economically, it doesn't have to be. Now, the two go hand in hand, as you mentioned, as we open up more things, there's more economic activity, there's more likelihood of spread. But again, we can mitigate that possibility with the appropriate public health investments. To answer the larger economic question is, do I think we're in for a two-year, 18-month right. uh, recession? The fundamental question is, are we looking at a V-shaped recovery or a U-shaped recovery? And the indicators would suggest both. I mean, is this a demand-side recession or a supply-side? I think it's a, a demand-side, uh, rather supply side recession. So that suggests it's V-shaped. However, if this lack of, of supply continues for several months, then the recovery is sustained. I do see some positive trends. I see um, uh, a reduction in the unemployment rate in the US, for example, a small one, but there. I see people pivoting into new kinds of industries. I see an opportunity to move Canadian wealth away from things like the tar sands towards high tech. So uh, are we innovative and creative enough to take advantage of an opportunity rather than to to dwell and suffer under the you know the uh, the weight of a crisis right you know, and, and that brings up an interesting point warren i was i was wondering about that not necessarily about getting away from or pivoting away from from the oil sands and such but does this not give canada an opportunity to embark as a leader in, in something like a mass producer of personal protective uh, equipment or you know, healthcare issues. Like our eyes have really been open to what we need when a pandemic or a health issue happens, and this is a, a pop, uh, you know, an opportunity for Canada to actually become a leader. Forgive me for being a cynic, uh, but I'm an Albertan. I oh, grew up fine. in uh, Calgary, and. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I've been hearing the siren song of diversification since I was uh, 14 years old, and Alberta has never achieved it. And I, you know, as somebody's worked for politicians across country and, and at the national level, um, politicians are necessarily limited by their term. And while they may have broad and long vision for how they want to reorder society and the economy um term limits just kind of generally mm. put make short shrift to them so uh yes i've seen all of the articles about how the pandemic however horrible it is and track creates opportunity but it you know do we i guess the question i would put back to you is do we really think our politicians have the unity of purpose or the unity of vision to actually pursue that kind of reordering you know i've been hearing mm -hmm. about politicians talking about rebuilding our manufacturing base since i was a squirt um, and they haven't done it yet maybe they will uh, maybe they'll do what germany and japan did post war um, but uh, they haven't done it yet.
All right. Let's uh, shift gears. And the p pandemic's exposed some serious shortcomings in long-term care in Canada. While it is a provincial jurisdiction, it, it seems there's a chorus of voices that like to see the federal government assume responsibility for it. Now, we asked that on our unpublished.vote question. 53% would like to see it uploaded. Peggy, what do you think? Put that in the hands of the federal government? Take it away from the provinces? Well, I don't think it's a matter of taking it away from the provinces. I think it's more like the like the you know the way we handle other aspects of healthcare, um, the National Healthcare Act. I mean, the feds provide transfers, but the jurisdiction for healthcare is still very much uh, the provinces. So I think what people are calling for is for the feds to invest, and in order you know in order to get. Uh, strong standards and a lot more money into healthcare. And by strong standards, I would certainly be in favor of getting private, you know, getting pri the you know, private sector out of healthcare. Um, but in order for that to happen, they have the feds have to put significant money on the table. And, and of course, even then it's going to be a hard negotiation with some provinces who won't want to know they, you know, give us the money, but don't tell us what to do. Um, but I think there's, you know, there's more than ample evidence that it is absolutely necessary to make some big changes. And one of them is ending the private, you know, for profit uh, long-term care. I mean, their record uh, generally and how they ought and how they did, uh, you know, during this. Now, that doesn't mean that there weren't also problems with the, uh, with the public ones, because in all cases, there needs to be more money in, in, uh, in the system. So, you know, I certainly am, uh, am very much in favor of the feds, um, you know, starting that dialogue, starting that dialogue right. with the provinces, recognizing that money, you know, money has to be put on the table. Significant money has to be put on the table well, in order for this to uh, to happen. And that gets into issues of what about pharmacare? You know, there's a, you know, that, what the government had promised. So, yeah. uh, but I've got to throw in one point on the green economy. The green economy is now an imperative I mean, in order for this planet to survive, we have to make the transition to a green economy. The province of Alberta didn't want to know until very recently. But now, the death knell of the, uh, you know, the, the lack of competitiveness of the, uh, of, of the oil sands is just so clear that it's not a growth industry. Yes, they'll still have, you know, they still have, they have, they still have certain export partners, but it's not growth. And so, you know, we've got the, probably the least inclined government one could imagine in Alberta to think about a green transition. But I think this is a conversation that I hope the feds have with all the provinces so that we can re we've got to rebuild our economy. So that's yeah. different. I mean, it's closer to the end of the war. So that's a real opportunity for us to, you know, to invest in high tech and to invest in all those areas. And, and Alberta has got an educated workforce, uh, in, in, in Calgary and other places that would be well positioned to do this. So I think it's a brand new ball game, uh, you know, in this area. And I also think the feds have got a bit of money. And I was talking to you, Ed, beforehand about how they were rather clever when they, when the defense, when the big increases in the defense budget were announced in 2016, because Trump wanted everybody to spend more money on defense, Canada back ended it. And the really big increases don't start till 2021. Well, at the time, there were a lot of defense experts who said, ah, you know, if, Can if Canada's in a recession in 2021, the biggest discretionary pot is defense. So we've got a nice place to get some money to do some of these things. All right. Now, Ray, I, I want to get back on long-term care here. And, you know, you obviously you're the scientist here. Which province got it right, which didn't? Like Ontario, Quebec, we're, we're, we're both basket cases. BC started off BC pretty bad. BC got it right. They got it right? BC got it right, without, without question, yeah. Uh, and for, for good reasons. I mean, they had good leadership in the in the uh, figure of Bonnie Henry, who lived through SARS and understands private uh, understands public health and emergencies. She understood that we had to privatize the long-term care centers quickly, meaning we couldn't let workers move back and forth between them because workers were a vector of transmission. This is where the need to control the privatization of these centers comes into the uh, ascendance. I thought I was going to have to have a fight with Peggy just now because she was saying she's a big supporter of private, and I misunderstood. I thought no. she was supporting the privatization uh, no, no. of long-term care, but she doesn't. The office So, uh, yeah, I don't have a problem with privatization of it, but there has to be oversight that's much more deeply 
uh, inculcated into the system. So BC understood that the workers had to be well compensated and disincentivized from having multiple centers to work on. They understood that there was a, a standardization of testing and had to be a saturated testing of all the people present in those centers and restriction of visitation because they identified the vulnerable population and stepped in to protect them. It's obvious what needed to be done. That's why it's mystifying that other provinces like Ontario failed to do this. And I'm quite angry about this, as are some of my colleagues, because we all knew what had to be done, and many of us assumed it was being done, but it wasn't. So there will be a reckoning when this is all over, over who is to blame for failing our seniors in the long-term care centers in Ontario and Quebec. That rec um, rec but the reckoning is a word I've used a lot, are, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it was left up to facilities. In Ontario, it was left up to the individual facilities. And in fact, many of them did do that. In fact, some of the earliest ones, my mother, my 96-year-old mother is in a public, uh, not-for-profit uh, run uh, home, long-term care home in Toronto. And the very first thing they did was they not only instituted only that the workers can only work at one facility, they also gave them as many hours as they wanted, which in they're all working different facilities because they're all part-time. And they also would not allow private care. Like we had someone also coming in to help and they, they stopped that. So it was only their people and their people could only work at one facility. But the trouble was it was left up. You know, it was left up to the individual healthcare mm -hmm. center right. to do it instead of the government mandating it. They did not have proper PE, PPE, and they did not have proper training in many cases as well. Oh, yeah. So there's failure at many levels of the system here that needs to be addressed. Oh, preparedness by by far, and more about that. You know, when when they find when the federal government finally admitted that COVID was here, then they find out all the stuff that was stockpiled after SARS is either outdated or gone. It's like somebody was asleep at the switch here. Yeah, but we all. All were. And, uh, you know, for example, with the long. Uh oh, we're losing them. Uh, long term care facility. Hi, can you hear me all right? Yep. No, it's Hello? breaking in and out. Yeah, I apologize. I thought that might happen. The long term care facilities in um, a lot of the provinces were made in the 60s and the 70s, like the bricks and mortar. And the physical layout of those facilities was communal. And that's facilitated, from what I understand, the dissemination of the virus much more efficiently than would have been the case otherwise. So one of the things we're gonna have to decide to do as a society uh, when this is all over, actually before it's all over, is are we prepared to rebuild entirely from the ground up long-term care facilities in a way that the, the physical layout of those buildings doesn't um, communicate a, another virus sufficiently as, as it, it was the case with coronavirus? You know, we mentioned long-term care. It had the hot spot. It was a hot spot for infection. And one of the problems with the pandemic, I found, was, was testing. And, you know, initially there weren't enough. And then it took too long to get the results. You know, we did an unpublished vote question on testing and what's contributing to the lack of testing. 27% felt there were mixed messages were, were the problem. And I, I'll ask you all, has anybody had a COVID test yet? I have. I have too. I just had one today. And, and mm -hmm. I don't, you know, you're in and out in 10 minutes. I, I can't see what the problem is. And you get the results in two days. What's changed it's since not, the beginning? It's not super pleasant, but it. Well, no, <laughs> it's, it's yeah. <laughs> there can be worse things that can happen. Yeah. That, it took yeah. a long time to get it up and running. I mean, yeah. that was the problem. It took a long time, it took a long time, but it's good that they're getting it up and running. The same as the tracing, but now the app. I mean, my phone tells me that the app is coming. You know, it's alerted me that I will be getting it soon. But I want to go back for a second to the PPE because, yeah. in the, because the for-profit, the role that for-profit played in the long-term care uh, debacle is very important. And in many cases, they had PPE, but the staff were terrified to use it because they have to account for every piece of equipment mm. to shareholders of the company that owns the chain. So it's blood curdling to read that, that the staff were afraid. So they were wearing the same gowns from room to room, doing everything to guarantee the spread of the virus because of their absolute fear of using equipment and then they, they would be censured by the bosses. 
You're watching the uh, debut of Unpublished TV as we look back on our uh, four uh, four months of coronavirus in Canada. And joining us on the uh, show today, uh, Warren Kinsella, lawyer and political column, uh, columnist, uh, Peggy Mason, the president of the Reno Institute, and Ray Diodanen. He is a uh, epidemiologist at the University of Ottawa. And check out his Twitter feed. It is extremely funny. Uh, <laughs> it really is, I, I have to tell you. Um, you know, let, let's move back to, or we'll move up. We talked about uh, a second wave or a possible second wave, and, and we asked our, uh, our our listeners and our viewers about that. What would contribute the most to a second wave? Almost four in ten felt it was the lack of social distancing. And, and Ray, you're the expert. That would be the number one. Uh, I'm worried about is the message get it, is the message fatigued, and then people just put their guard down. It's happening already. People are putting their guard down. People don't think this is a problem anymore. When I say people, I mean a certain sector mm -hmm. of society. There are those who are still terrified, perhaps too much so. But all we need is a sufficiently large number of people, particularly the young, to stop taking this seriously and the problem reasserts itself. And well, that's what's happening already. Um, unfortunately, that same demographic is the least likely to suffer serious consequences from infection. And so it's unlikely that they'll learn from their peers that this is a bad thing to do. So one of the challenges going forward is how to retask public health messaging. One of the frustrating things about this entire uh, episode uh, in history is how we failed in the messaging at every step of the way. Everything we thought we knew about what had to be ha done in public health messaging did not apply in this new era where transparency is everything. Message management is not that important. What matters is being honest with people and being honest with what you know, what you don't know. So as soon as people got a sense of duplicity or of equivocation, that was transformed into distrust for authority. And that's what we're seeing right now is the, the results of that distrust playing out as a denial of the existence of the epidemic. So um, I don't expect good things to happen in the fall unless we get a handle on the messaging and to get people a little bit afraid again, but also confident that absorbing and embracing these public health measures will get us through this. Distancing, hand hygiene, right. mask wearing. Well, you know, and uh, Warren, the thing I, I kind of worry about is when uh, airlines start going again like the, we've got the little flights the, the short flights right now but when airlines WestJet and Air Canada start flying full time I that's that's where I get a little worried that we might be looking but, at a second wave but the point about public institutions is critically important you know and it's not just the most extreme example of the most powerful man on earth literally advocating injecting people with bleach like that actually happened yeah like that you know leave that one aside on, on the day that 60 million people in Wuhan were subject to lockdown, we had Canada's federal minister of health saying that the risk to Canada was low. And people looked at that, as the doctor indicated, and the, those were two conflicting pieces of information. It's what I do for a living is how to, you know, teach people like the minister of health how to communicate. And it was just completely it was crazy to suggest that the Chinese would subject 60 million people to lockdown for no reason at all. They clearly had done it for some good reason. And uh, we had public officials at the most senior level here in Canada saying, you know, it's low risk and, and it should be okay. So that engendered a lack of trust in the messaging that followed thereafter. And it's, as I said at the outset, it's to the credit of our public officials that they've brought back some credibility into the system. And there is some belief and the, the statistics bear that out. You look at how we are doing compared to, you know, some of the red states in the United States. It's, it's a striking difference. And it's it for the United States is a fatal difference. Well, we've and, got our and Ed, if I can jump in, I think okay. that's borne out as well by the latest poll, how the government has regained how I think the feds in the lead and then the provinces seeing, uh, you know, that that was that that, that credibility was there. The um, uh, the latest polling just out on mask wearing in Canada is extraordinarily uh, um, encouraging because um, a majority, first of all, overall, a majority support making it mandatory. But uh, I think there are two provinces, Manitoba and Saskatchewan, where a majority don't support making it mandatory. But overwhelmingly, in every province, they say 
uh, that if it's made mandatory, they will follow it. And they're not opposed, I mean, uh, to making it mandatory. If left up to them, they wouldn't make it mandatory. But if the government makes it mandatory, then they're not opposed to it. And that is extremely uh, important because now with this latest open letter to the WHO from 100 and whatever, 50 scientists from around the world really expressing concern that, that, there's a, that the smaller droplets may be traveling further uh, and so that the two meter may not be enough. That really underscores the importance of the masks. So I think that's very good news. And of course, it's now been made mandatory. I mean, Ottawa tomorrow yeah. uh, in public places, it'll be mandatory. And in Toronto, it already is. And with rapid transit as well. So, you know, I think that's critical. And I also, I mean, I'd be interested, Ray, in your view on this, but you know, when we get into when we get into the fall and we've got the flu season as well, it seems to me that it's even more important that everybody be wearing masks on pu public transit and in crowded places. And um, you know, that's a benefit anyway because it helps reduce the spread of coughs, it's, colds, it's and very and likely flus. we're going to have a mild flu season because of all the extra. Uh, steps were taken to prevent COVID, which is remarkable. And I will say that pandemics have a way of revealing the truth of a society. It reveals the cracks in societies as well as the strengths in societies. In the USA, it's dividing them like nobody's business. Here, what we've seen, I think, is a strong delineation culturally between our ethic and the American ethic. Of all about personal responsibility and personal freedoms. They're focusing heavily on personal freedoms, how mass are intrusions into their rights, whereas we, based upon the stats you cited, seem to be focusing on our opportunity to protect each other, which is extraordinary. I take a lot of positives away from that. Right? So uh, historically, pandemics have always revealed the truth of a people and provided an opportunity to rebuild from the ground up. And that's exactly what we're seeing in real time. I, I find it just so fascinating to watch unfold before my eyes the disassembly deconstruction and reconstruction of a society now we've got our first question coming in uh, off of uh, facebook and uh, warren how is the public service going to change moving forward do you think a percentage of the income to non-essential public sector payroll will be clawed back to compensate i don't know well, you the union. you're all in auto and i'm not but i yeah. would say that the episode with we and uh, the keelbergers this week mm. was not helpful um you know along with harming the young people who were seeking volunteer hours and then along with harming our faith in our public institutions it also i would imagine was not a morale builder for our federal public servants our, our federal public service in extraordinary circumstances, put together from the ground up programs that had previously not existed in order to assist people in this pandemic. And they did that in a much more speedy fashion than their equivalents did in the United States. So the, you know, for the response of the Trudeau guys to hand over more or less sole sourced a billion dollar contract to these people that they were allied with, I would imagine the impact that had on the public service would be uh, not helpful. So I think the Trudeau guys need to learn from that and have some faith as they did at the outset in the public service, because we have the finest public service in the world, in my opinion, and we need to rely upon them and not privatize the system in the way that the Trudeau guys sought to do. One last question for everybody. And uh, we'll start with you, Peggy. What do you miss the most since the pandemic began? Oh, mine is a very simple one because as I was talking about earlier, the work situation is, you know, we've been able to carry on our work from home offices, have webinars, and that's going very, very well. But the, the simple one is family. Um, you know, my, my son and his partner are uh, not seeing family. They are, they are urban farmers and, uh, you know, they're doing, uh, they've turned their whole, they lost 50% of their business overnight when the restaurants closed. So they turned it into online ordering and delivery. So it's vitally important that neither of, you know, that neither of them mm. get COVID. And so, you know, they're not, you know, I don't, I, I see them irregularly at a distance with a mask. Similarly with my mother, my 96 year old mother and the rest of my family. 
So very, very simple. Oh. I really, really miss the close contact uh, with family. Of course, we do all the webinars and all the Zooms and all, not webinars, all the Zoom mm -hmm. and meetings and everything. But, you know, it's not the same. So I'm really looking forward to a backyard with family in it, even if we're all spread far out and just, you know, enjoying a, a drink and a laugh uh, uh, in, the, in a nice evening, warm evening. Uh, Warren, what about you? What do you miss since the pandemic started? Family, same thing. Yeah. Uh, my mom is uh, turning 88 tomorrow, so I'm heading to Toronto to celebrate her birthday at a distance. And uh, it sucks, you know, you yeah. can't have your mom. And uh, so, you know, the long-term impact of all of that, I think, is yet to be measured. And uh, I don't, because we tend to be social beings. And um, I think we're, we're missing some things that we haven't even been able to articulate yet. But anyway, in my case, I'm going to celebrate my mom's birthday. And I'll tell her, all of you guys say happy birthday to That we do, yeah. that we do. Ray, what do you miss? I was going to say family, but I'm in Toronto right now visiting my family, so that's taken care of. Instead, I'll say I miss overcrowded undergraduate classrooms filled with anxiety-written students who are paying too much tuition to hear me tell inappropriate jokes. So instead, I'd tell them on Twitter. So uh, I miss that. I miss that human contact with large numbers of people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, this is this is festival season in Ottawa, and I, you know, we'd all be around Blues Fest right now. That's the part that I, I really miss. But I want to thank all three of you for joining us on our unpublished TV uh, inaugural show. Uh, Warren Kinsella is a lawyer and political commentator, and his mom turns 88 tomorrow. Peggy Mason, president of the Rito Institute, and Ray Dandandan. He's a professor of epidemiology at the University of Ottawa. Now, coming up on our next show, we'll be discussing the mandatory face mask and why there's such a reticence to wear it. I want to thank you for joining us on Unpublished TV. Stay safe. I'm Ed Hand.